Hi, Ryan. This is Karen Johnson. Hi, Karen. How are you? I'm good. Welcome to Thank the you meeting. again for that article you sent me. I put it out on the SIG page today. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. How was that? Hi, uh, ev hi, everybody. And hi, Karen. This is Carol Holland. <laughs> hi, hi, Carol. Karen. How are you? I'm fine. And our, uh, Armando. Hi. Karen, just because we have a little bit of time, I'm uh, curious about uh, your connection with phenomenology. And uh, do you tend to be more classical or hermeneutical, interpretative? Um, I, I think we might need to make a point in some of our meetings that although we're leading these different groups, we're not necessarily experts. <laughs> And I really consider myself more a student of phenomenology than I do an expert. I have a lot of students who try to do um, that design for their dissertations. Um, many of them, I got involved a few years ago because many students were coming back from residencies, changing whatever they had gone with, you know, and come, you know, when they came back because somebody there told them they thought their study was phenomenological and. And often they weren't, so I had to do a lot of reading and a lot of finding the resources. And, and um, most of the students I've worked with have done hermeneutical uh, research as opposed to classical, although I do have one now trying to do a classical. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm still very much a student myself. So gotcha. I'm interested in finding whatever anybody has to share. And I thought the article that you shared this week was just really excellent. Oh, thank you. That was one of our fellows from a prior year and had completed a phenomenological study. And I didn't even remember that he had done the study uh, using phenomenology. Uh, yeah. And I believe it was uh, more of a hermeneutical phenomenology. I scanned the article. But... Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to remember he even stated which it was. I don't think he did, but based on the way he went about it, I would say it was probably more hermeneutical. Yeah. I've only had one student of mine, one doctoral student, actually complete a classical phenomenology study. And there, I mean, it's uh, tougher to stick by those rigid guidelines and bracketing and epochet right. and all that. Yes, I agree. Um, and you have to also be coming from a very particular worldview, I think. Uh, that uh, well, I mean, she was this is within a psychology program, so that right. made for some interesting discussions, though. That's for sure. <laughs> I can imagine. And in truth, I find that many of our students probably don't have the educational background to do uh, a phenom study. It, they don't often know what their worldview is, mm -hmm. and. You know, they need to do so much reading and reflecting and thinking critically that they're not necessarily used to doing. But that for most of our students, or for many of my students, that's a really hard design for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed at a few other schools they have a number of uh, general qualitative. Um, dissertations that get passed, and I don't see that many here. Where they just describe it as a general qualitative or a thematic content analysis, for example. Yeah, Which I don't I find see much of that here either, right? And I don't, I don't see a lot of support for many of the different kinds of uh, qualitative studies. I see, I see Phil's on with us now too. Hi, Phil. Mm -hmm. um, and in Brian the office. Just joined. In the, in the office hours today, there was a brief look at some different kinds of research 
uh, designs and, and qualitative and listed case studies and phenomenological. <laughs> As if that were the only two options. Yeah. You know, our resident Delphi expert was online. <laughs> could have forget, you know, could have forget. Ryan, it's, uh, it's 4 p.m., uh, 7 p.m. Eastern. Do you want to wait a little bit or you want to start now? Well, I think we'll probably have people trickling in for the next five to ten minutes. Um, we can go ahead and start. Uh, and my first few slides are just an introduction to me anyway, so they won't be missing a whole lot. I mean, uh, if, if you're okay with that, Armando. I'm fine with that, Ryan. Sure. Did you want to do intros, or you mentioned uh, starting off with some introduction or something? Uh, well, if you're ready, right, we can go ahead and start. Uh, this um, webinar is, is being recorded, and I notice Phil is on the lines. Phil, you notice that now we're getting better with the sound, <laughs> unfortunately, but that's the nature of this, right? We're getting better. Uh, it's just I get an echo, but I, it's going to disappear as soon as uh, as soon as I put myself in mute. Um, so thank you very much, Ryan, for uh, conducting this webinar. Um, Ryan is an associate on University Research Chair. Go uh, join this with Dr. Cabrici. I, I don't see her on the line now, but hopefully she will join later or she can listen to the recorder. So, and, and Ryan belongs to the Center for Leadership Studies and Educational Research. I see you are at John at uh, the Sophia University. And uh, oh, it looks like you're becoming a therapist, right? So maybe. I found something. Sophia. <laughs> so that, was, that, that, was, <laughs> that was my iPhone. Anyway, go ahead. Thank you. I, I'm really excited, real happy that things are getting better. And we are getting, uh, you know, to become a little bit more tuned in the way we do this. Thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and put myself on mute. Yeah, you're very welcome. I'm really glad to be here. And and like uh, Armando said, I mean, in many ways, uh, this process of going through the webinars is an iterative process, much like research. You know, and with each. Uh, webinar we're presented with certain challenges that we then need to overcome for the next webinar and I'm sure this one will be uh, no different well you just don't know what the challenges are yet but uh, thank you everyone for attending and uh, just a quick note if you are uh, have your audio on um, if you can mute that would be great because then we get feedback um, if you don't mute your lines we uh, start to hear a lot of rustling and, and whatnot but to prevent that just go ahead and make sure that you're muting your line uh, until you want to ask a question uh, the other thing is that if you are wearing a headset that will help uh, reduce the amount of echo that happens uh, through the line as well so uh, as Armando said, my name is Ryan Rominger. Uh, I am the Associate University Research Chair in CLOSER. I'm also adjunct research faculty at SOFIA and the California Institute of Integral Studies. Uh, that simply means that I've been doing dissertations there, or continuing to do dissertations there. Uh, I was an associate faculty at SOFIA University for many years, uh, starting in 2008 through 2015. Um, I'm also a therapist in training at Renew Wellness Center. So my PhD, my first master's and PhD is in psychology, and I'm obtaining a master's of science in clinical mental health counseling uh, at the moment, I'm finishing up that program, just finishing my hours. So with that, let me launch into the slides here. So this is the agenda. I'm going to give a brief introduction, and then after that, we'll get into the context for today's discussions, uh, the main types of mixed method designs, talk about those pesky and informative symbols and boxes, uh, talk about some examples, and then open it up for questions. Uh, how did I get into mixed methods research? Well, I actually started uh, when I was in my dissertation process. 
And I've had the good fortune of working with Rosemary Anderson and William Broad, who are two methodologists that uh, have written texts about methodology and um, especially different types of uh, transformational and transpersonal research methods. Uh, Rosemary Anderson's method that she designed is called intuitive inquiry and William Broad des uh, designed a method called integral inquiry. But because of having two methodologists around, I was inspired to dive into research methods myself and try and uh, figure out a unique way to address the topic that I had in my dissertation. Um, so I was a budding methodologist at that point, trying to connect uh, hermeneutics, heuristics, art-based research methods, because I was also getting a certificate in expressive arts therapy at the time, uh, and trying to figure out how to put all these different pieces together. Uh, and I ended up with essentially a mixed methods design with an intuitive inquiry overlay and art-based inquiry overlay and had a pre-test, post-test um, set of surveys that I collected data on. Uh, I conducted interviews, individual interviews and group-based interviews uh, from, with all my participants. Um, I ended up running uh, groups for five weeks and that was the intervention between the pre-test and the post-test. And so I had the surveys, the interviews, and I also collected all of the artwork that the participants created and did a, kind of a content thematic analysis based on the imagery and the art. And then had three different resonance panels, uh, which is an intuitive inquiry piece. It's similar to a focus group. Uh, essentially three different focus groups, one of art-based research uh, therapists or art, art therapists, another one of um, spiritual directors and a third of, um, yeah, I forget what the other one was. But anyway, I had those three focus groups looked at the art to see what themes they found within the art. And then I combined those and looked at how, what the correlation was between what they found, what I found, what was coming through in the interviews and what was coming through in the surveys. So at um, that point was the synthesis of the different types of uh, methods. And that really got me excited. From that point on, I was sold on mixed methods and uh, trying out all these different types of methods. That landed me several years later in uh, a position working with Sage Publications on the methods and research project. Um, so if you go into our databases, you'll notice that you can click on the link um, methods and research and pull up a lot of different articles on research methods, whether it's phenomenology or heuristics, hermeneutics. And I was one of the reviewers um, on that project and was very fortunate to see a lot of that come through and provide feedback on those. I've also graduated about 20 dissertation students at this point um, using a variety of methods from mixed methods, qualitative and quantitative. Um, so that's a bit of my background. Uh, I, I am currently using mixed methods design, a sequential design for a study uh, right now and as an exploratory study, qualitative first and then quantitative. Uh, we'll get a little bit more into that, the exploratory versus explanatory designs. Um, but I, I just find them fascinating, so. All right. The first textual overview of mixed method designs was actually published in 2003 by uh, Tasha Corey and Tedley, and it was a handbook of mixed methods in social, sci social and behavioral sciences. Uh, however, mixed methods is uh, much older than that. It goes back, some say, back to 1959 when Campbell and Fisk uh, published their convergent and discriminant validation by the multi-trait and multi-method matrix. Uh, for those of you interested in the history, uh, you can go back and look at that, but that's when the discussion really started uh, getting launched formally, and it's had its uh, ebbs and flows with more focus on quantitative or qualitative over time. Obviously, there's a more of a focus with uh, randomized controlled designs in certain, well, in psychology in particular, uh, my field. Um, although there's a lot of qualitative research that is now coming through and being uh, supported as well. The main text that I use when I'm looking at mixed methods designs or when I'm teaching mixed methods is I, the Cresswell and Final Clark. Uh, I had the good fortune of meeting Cresswell thanks to Mark McCaslin. Uh, Cresswell was actually um, the mentor of 
and I think dissertation chair for Mark McCaslin, uh, Dean McCaslin. And he brought, um, when we were at Sophia University, brought John Creswell up to the university and, and we got to meet Creswell and hear him present on mixed methods. But uh, I like his text and the way he describes it. It's very clearly laid out if you're going to use it with students. Here are some of the texts, the two on the right, the purple and the white one, designing and conducting mixed methods research. Uh, that's the first and second edition. There is a third edition that is out now. It's of 2017. I just don't have it, so it's not up there. But uh, the other text, just research design, qualitative, quantitative, and mixed methods approaches by John Cresswell is a, another source. There are several journals. Uh, the one that I point a lot of students towards is the Journal of Mixed Methods Research. Again, this is one of Cresswell's endeavors. Um, he helped found this and get it going. Um, let's see if I can open this. And now I'm going to have to share just to show you. All right, can you see the web page that I am on. Anyone? Not yet. You may want to share a particular screen or the whole desktop. I saw it, but it disappears now blank, at least on my, now I see it. Okay, thank you. So uh, this is the home page at Sage Journals for Journal of Mixed Methods Research. Um, and. Um, this is the, the, the current issue from 2018. I uh, just wanted to give you a pointer also in the slides so that you can direct people here. Um, there's, you know, it's, it's, it's a definitely a journal that's going strong. A number of the articles in this journal are examples of mixed method research uh, that you know, the, uh, the uh, publishers feel are good and strong examples of different types of mixed methods research. There are some articles on different issues that arise within conducting mixed method research as well. And uh, you'll see some of that. But there's another journal that I would direct you towards for some of that conversation. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. And here's the International Journal of Social Research Methodology. And within this journal, uh, not only do you find, you know, just a, a lot of different types of research methods, but you, all, you find uh, discussions of how to execute mixed methods research. And uh, a little bit later uh, in the discussion today, I'll be talking about two articles that came out of here that are discussing um, current issues and challenges to the way that Cresswell and Plano Clark describe mixed methods research. Is everybody able to see this page from Taylor and Francis on social research methodology? Yes, I can see it. Okay, great, thanks. All right, back to PowerPoint. Some of the assumptions that underlie mixed methods research. Uh, it often comes from a philosophical foundation of pragmatism, that uh, the method that gets the data that you want, that answers the questions that you're looking for is what you use, uh, very utilitarian in that way. Um, however, not all mixed methods research is. Uh, some of it is very much founded within a particular theoretical orientation or a particular worldview, uh, whether it's the um, positivist or post-positivist uh, uh, worldviews, constructivist, uh, what, what have you. Um, but a lot of it, especially coming, um, one of Cresswell's perspectives in particular, is coming from a uh, pragmatist perspective. Another assumption is that mixed methods research is combining qualitative and quantitative and that it helps minimize the problems of um, both. So essentially by combining them, you're reducing the problem of generalizability found in qualitative, for example, and you're reducing the um, not having depth of, uh, of data and awareness of what the subjective experience is of your participants that might be found in quantitative. 
However, the caution is if you do it poorly, then you can actually gain the problems of both sets of research. So uh, you might, if you have a poor statistical or quantitative um, piece with poor statistics, then you, know, you might have very weak conclusions coming from the quantitative piece. And if you have a very shallow analysis on the qualitative side, then you know, obviously the, the conclusions that you're drawing aren't uh, very robust. And um, uh, you can't really use those uh, to their fullest uh, in that effect. So you ha really have to be cognizant of when you're combining them that you're doing it in a way that you're using the strengths and you're doing them well in order to gain the benefits of both, or else you do end up with the problems of both. A third assumption is that combining helps triangulate the phenomenon better and to better understand uh, what is going on. So uh, look at it, or you can think of it as, you know, looking at a coffee cup and rotating the coffee cup. You look at it from one direction, you see the, the logo of whatever coffee joint you're at, and then as you're twisting it, you're seeing, you know, the different things like the uh, caution on the back that it's hot or whatever. But uh, principle being that as you look at something from different angles using different tools that then you can get more of a three-dimensional, a more full perspective of what's going on with whatever phenomena you're looking at. That's what's referred to as triangulation. However, if it's not well coordinated, then rather than just to use metaphors, rather than two blind people looking at the same elephant and you know discussing what they're feeling and getting a better picture of what it is that they're feeling, even though they're each feeling their own um, piece, what you actually end up with is one piece person feeling an elephant and one person feeling a lion, you know, because they're they're directed in in different ways rather than being coordinated towards the one phenomena that you're trying to look at. So that is one danger, um, and you really need to be cognizant of how you're directing your attention and your research questions, your uh, data collection, and the synthesis and analysis. What? No. I'm sorry, I'm hearing somebody. Was there a question? Okay. Um, so mixed method strategies uh, are really about the bringing together of um, and collecting qualitative and quantitative and conducting qual qualitative and qu quantitative analysis with on data sets. The one of the challenges then is how do we communicate these different pieces when we're writing about it and that's where um, Cresswell and Plano Clark have come up with these different symbols to mean different things as you're discussing it. So if you see a plus, uh, often within uh, the discussion on looking at the different pieces, whether it's qual and quant, the plus will often refer to a concurrent data collection. That means that you're collecting it at the same time. An arrow will refer to sequential. First you're doing uh, one strand, data strand, and then the other. So first quant and then qual, or first qual and then quant. Capitalization talks about the weight and priority. So uh, in the example at the bottom of the screen here, quant is in all caps. That would mean that the quantitative is more heavily weighted in that study, whereas the qual, which is in lower case, is uh, not weighted as heavily. Uh, there's a lot of visual depiction within mixed methods trying when you're talking about the, the method. Uh, Q-U-A-N often is used for quantitative. I like to add the T just for clarity, uh, and especially in this presentation, I've added the T, and you'll see that throughout. Um, Cresswell does use Q-U-A-N often um, in his texts, but I do use the T, and qual for qualitative. The arrow pointing to that, that box, uh, what that is actually showing is an embedded design. Uh, they use boxes to depict uh, where and in what relationship the quantitative and qualitative data strands have. So you'll see either two boxes next to each other if they're you know, sequential with an arrow pointing from one box to the other, and you'll have quant or qual within the respective boxes. Uh, this one is, uh, again, an embedded design because the qualitative box is inside of the larger quantitative box, with quantitative being more heavily weighted. 
And these are all things that when considering a mixed methods design that you need to think of, you know, the timing of your uh, data collection and the timing of your analysis and the timing of when you're going to bring together, mix, or synthesize your conclusions or your data or your analysis, well, how things are different, how different things are weighted, um, but also the theory that you're using, whether there's an overarching theory, if there's um, different uh, worldviews within the different quantum qual aspects that you then need to synthesize at a later date. Uh, there's lots of different ways to, to handle that. The main strategies or models within mixed methods, you have sequential mix, mixed methods, which again are one strand happening and then the other as depicted at the bottom there, the quant qual or the qual quant. And the researcher is seeking to elaborate on or expand on the findings of one method with another method, using another method. Um, the page numbers, by the way, are from the uh, blue book above. Let me go back here the second edition of the Designing Conducted Mixed Methods Research. The second main strategy or model that Cresswell and Planocart talk about are concurrent mixed methods. And concurrent are merging quantitative and qualitative data collections. So they're happening at the same time. And you can integrate the information either at the analysis piece or during interpretation after you've analyzed them. Um, you can analyze them separately or you can analyze them together and then, um, and then make your conclusions. It just depends on your focus and your research questions. The third main type uh, of mixed method design is the transformative mixed methods. And uh, the thing that really sets this apart is that the transformative uses the overarching theoretical lens or umbrella, which provides the framework for the entire study. Uh, you're collecting multiple types of data to answer your questions about a particular topic. Again, uh, it's important, especially with the interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary studies. You'll see um, a lot of this type of mixed method design. And an example here is in psychology, the lens might be queer theory and you might be investigating, for example, the expression of gender among transgender individuals in early, early adolescence. So queer theory being the overarching umbrella, the theoretical lens, and then collecting qualitative and quantitative data from uh, transgender adolescents or <coughs> adults who then reflect back on adolescence and gender expression. So research questions are kind of unique within mixed methods. When you're dealing with just one um, type of research, like it's, um, quantitative, the research question is framed in a particular way that um, often you're looking, you're integrating in hypotheses uh, and, and uh, null hypothesis. In qualitative research, you might be asking questions about, you know, what is the lived experience of, um, what's the nature of. But in mixed methods research, uh, it becomes tricky because uh, you need to think about uh, an overarching question. It's, it's recommended that you have an overarching question that actually incorporates both the quant and qual, and then you have your separate quantitative and qualitative research questions that are sub-questions underneath that overarching question. So you have basically your overarching study question, what is it you're really looking for, what are you addressing? And then um, within each strand um, of, and that's what is called qualitative or quantitative strand, you have your specific research question uh, and maybe sub-questions within that, depending on how detailed you are. If you are doing sequential, when you're writing up your uh, proposal you, or your article, you'll have your you know, first strand research question first and then your second second. If concurrent, then it's based on weight. You know, which are you giving more strength, a quantitative or qualitative strand? Whichever has the largest weight, that's then what you put first when you're writing it up. And a final consideration when thinking about research questions are at what point do you merge? Uh, so you have your collection, your, your research question, but then 
um, you also need to be thinking about pointing at where are you bringing those together and really synthesizing and making conclusions from your data. Yeah. Let's get into some specific examples. Sequential explanatory designs start with quantitative first, your quantitative data collection and data analysis, and then move into a qualitative data collection and data analysis. And the in, then you get into the interpretation of the entire analysis. It's possible that you could end up actually with interpretation after the data analysis of the quant that then leads into the qualitative strand, um, but it's also possible to do it after you've collected and analyzed all of your data. You get into the uh, interpretation of the end for the entire study. The example I use here is studying significant life events uh, during college of recent college graduates, the quantitative piece. Uh, you reach out to and uh, collect data from 500 college students who complete a survey. Then you select 30 exemplar students that really uh, demonstrate whatever you're looking for with significant life events and interview those 30 people. And then you interpret based on the quantitative survey and the qualitative uh, interviews that you've done, you know, what is your conclusion about significant life events in, during college. So while the first one was the explanatory design. This next one is the exploratory design. The sequential exploratory design uses qualitative first and the qualitative strand data collection data analysis and then moves into the quantitative data collection data analysis and then the interpretation. In this case, you uh, might be studying again the same topics, significant life events, but you have your qual strand first. You interview 30 college students, they complete the interview, and once the interview is complete, you might come um, do a preliminary data analysis and find out, oh, well, you know, you know, based on the interviews, here are the main variables, or here are some things that stuck out, and that leads us to the realization that we really want to send out these um, measures for uh, surveying students. It might mean also that you create unique types of um, survey questions that you then send out as well. And you send that out to the 500 students, you collect that data. Once you've collected the quantitative data, then you come back together and you interpret all of that. I noticed somebody uh, opened up their mic. Is there a question? Okay. Ryan, what about if I mute all and then unmute you just to, to be sure that we are fine? Sure, just, sure. Yeah, let's try to do that quickly. I think I can do that. And now um, you should be able to talk. Great. Thank you, Armando. Sure. Uh, now getting into the sequ sequential transformative designs. Uh, the larger box indicates that there's a theoretical overlay uh, that within which the qualitative and quantitative strands are happening. The arrow indicates that it's sequential. First the qual, the qual is uh, weighted more heavily and then moving into the quant. Right. The second box is a sequential transformative design but it's reversed with the quant more heavily weighted and then moving into the qual. An example would be you know, something along the lines of transformational leadership as the um, overarching umbrella. Qualitative, you might be interviewing business leaders who are identified as holding a transformational stance and looking at their decision-making processes. And so you're asking them in their interviews, what makes you a transformational leader? You know, what stance do you have and, and uh, what characteristics or however you wanna uh, spin that particular interview. Then you move into, based on those answers, surveying a larger set. You know, the, uh, now it's moving into the quantitative piece. Uh, maybe surveying 200 business leaders and looking at how their different, uh, how these qualitative, uh, or how these qualities that you identified in the interviews might be emerging based on um, surveying them and based on the interviews. After you get that data, then you analyze it and come to some sort of conclusion and synthesize your results. So those are the sequential 
uh, designs, the transformative, exploratory, and explanatory designs. Moving into the concurrent, you have a concurrent triangulation design, and you have the quant and the qual. You'll notice that both are capitalized, so they're weighted equally. The plus means concurrent, happening at the same time. You have the uh, quantitative, if you go underneath the quan box, the quantitative data collection that leads to the quantitative data analysis. Same with the qual. And the data results might be compared across the two, or you might wait again until after you've analyzed the two separately and then come into your conclusion or your discussion piece where you're uh, synthesizing at that point. It really depends on uh, your goal and, and what you're trying to accomplish. An example here is the desire to know more about the use of expressive arts within therapy. As an art therapist, something that I'm particularly interested in. Simultaneously collect survey data from 500 counselors in private practice regarding expressive art use. For example, how often, for what issues, uh, what is it best used for, uh, how do people respond. And then at the same time, you're also recruiting 15 counselors to interview about their use of expressive arts to find out more about the specifics of how it was utilized within their particular therapy. So what's their subjective use of expressive arts? Uh, because they're weighted equal, equally, you're not um, valuing one data set more or giving one more attention than the other. And you bring them together in the, the final analysis and come to some conclusion. So we uh, concurrent triangulation, now we're moving into concurrent embedded designs. So while the above is happening at the same time, they're weighted equally, here the weight is given to one or the other. So in number one on the left, you have the embedded design. Again, a square within a square designates embedded. Quant is the heavier weighted um, strand, whereas qual is uh, less uh, has less weight, whereas in number two, it's reversed. The qual has the main weight, whereas the quant has less weight. And you have the analysis of findings uh, that just, it's, the data is being collected at the same time, but um, uh, the analysis and coming to conclusions is based off of the whole data set that you've collected. An example for number one is, you know, an efficacy-based randomized control um, experiments on meditation uh, with sixth graders to help increase their focus. And that's the main quantitative piece. But you also might want to know just what the subjective experience is for some of the students. So you pick several of the students and interview them to find out what it was like you know, to go through that meditation experience. So the quant, really, you're looking at what's the efficacy of this intervention and um, the, the quant is weighted more heavily. But you also want some additional data to support what's happening and, and, and uh, have some juice behind the results. And so you do interview a few people. Now, who you interview, again, is another question. You could interview um, a broad range, whether it's you know some that did really poor and some that did really well, and, and look at the entire range. Or you could pick, you know, six people that did really well as exemplars that stand out. It really, de again, depends on what you want to show. And the final concurrent is the concurrent transformative. And you have the triangulation or embedded design. The number one triangulation design denoted by the plus, quant and qual are equally weighted, and so they're all caps. And there's an overarching theory so it's really the concurrent triangulation transformative design. Number two is the concurrent embedded transformative design, again noted as the um, qual within a box, and then you could have the quant within the larger box and the overarching theory. I'm not going to give an example here. I think you're, you're getting the idea, probably. So challenges of mixed methods design. Uh, one of the things that when I'm working with dissertation students is that I will always tell the student that mixed methods can take more time. In fact, I probably should erase the can there. It almost always takes more time. Even if you're doing a concurrent study, 
if you're engaging in a concurrent study. You still have to collect the, all the participants. You still have to go through all the analysis of both the quant and the qual. Um, it just mixed methods does take more time and it can take more resources, whether it's you know money, if you're a dissertation student, that's tuition, as well as sending out um, the uh, recruitment flyers and you know, people that you're using to transcribe, as well as help you with statistics if you're doing both of those, if you're not doing it yourself. So in other words, it just takes more resources uh, to engage. Also, another challenge is that you need skills for both qual and quant methods. And you can solve this by two ways. Either as an individual, you have to be really well versed in quantitative and qualitative methods. That doesn't mean you have to know all the statistics or all the qualitative um, types of thematic analysis um, in, you know, for example, Saldana's book. But um, you need to be familiar with them and be able to execute them in a way that keeps the quality of both the quant and the qual at a high level. So as I said at the beginning, so that you don't end up with the negatives of both the quantum qual, you want the positives of both the quantum qual strands. Another approach, though, is to have a team approach. You might have one individual that's really holding the quantitative piece and is really good at quantitative, and another person who's really good at the qualitative, and you come together to you know, each hold your respective pieces and have a mixed method designed together. The fourth challenge is trouble determining when to merge or synthesize the strands. Uh, this again depends on your goals. If you are analyzing a strand and you know, you're using sequential design, you might do your data collection that, um, and analysis and come to some conclusion and then move into the second strand. And you might not really have to synthesize at all except for in the, you know, the conclusion when you're talking about the overall study. However, other types of mixed methods, especially concurrent designs, you have to figure out at what point do you bring your data analysis together. You can do it at the data analysis stage or you can do it at uh, after you've analyzed your respective uh, data sets separately and come to conclusions, then you can integrate it there. Um, it's not, a, I mean, it, it is important, but uh, it's, it, it's in some ways sometimes it flows naturally. In my experience with actually conducting mixed methods, often it, that decision flows rather naturally. But it's good to be thinking about it at the beginning. A fifth challenge is trouble with unclear research questions, as we noted before, uh, a whole slide on research questions. Uh, it, there is the suggestion to have one overall uh, overarching mixed methods research question, and within that, the specific research questions. If you aren't clear, as with any research, if you don't have clear research questions, you can stray, you can end up collecting data that really isn't uh, a part of or informing um, the other strand. You know, your strands might not be able to be matched up and you'll end up with two disparate sets of data that you don't really know what to do with, uh, which wastes a lot of time and resources. A sixth challenge is that some combinations just don't work well. I have seen students try and mix certain types of research that you know, I shake my head and I think, how are you going to ever finish this? One, and two, theoretically, the, the pieces just don't mesh. Uh, one of the most common things, I, I, problems that I have seen is I'll have somebody, uh, a student come to me um, or a faculty member come to me and say, okay, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm new to mixed method research. What I want to do is uh, have this big, study, I'm going to get 500 people, and then I'm going to uh, interview, um, uh, you know, three people and have this uh, classical phenomenology piece on the side. But I want to do it all within the next six months. And I, it's really difficult to mesh those together, especially if you have time constraints. Um, a general thematic analysis might be more appropriate. If, and having you know 10 or 15 participants as opposed to a classical phenomenology which is really structured in and of itself 
um, especially if you're going the Georgie route. Uh, and there's a lot of interview, and you're interviewing each person several times, getting a lot of data. And at the same time, you're thinking about this big quantitative piece. It just uh, it tends not to mix well. And some theories don't mix well. Um, so you have to be really cognizant of how you are thinking from an epistemological and ontological perspective, uh, world view perspective of your data and how you're making meaning about the data that you're collecting and what is it telling you. Um, that's why I think with Cresswell, a lot of the a lot of the base belief comes down to pragmatism. I'm using this tool and I'm using this tool and I'm bringing them together because these are the tools that are going to answer my questions. Now that has been challenged and we'll get to that in a second. So another example, um, coming back to you know, just, just using examples uh, within mixed methods research. Forrest et al. Uh, conducted a study and published 2013 called Training Directors' Perceptions of Faculty Behaviors When Dealing with Trainee Competence Problems, a Mixed Method Pilot Study. Um, and I want to get a, give a shout out to Dr. Cabricci here because she sent this article to me and brought it to my awareness uh, about a week ago. This study was uh, um, a very interesting mixed method study because of the qualitative strand for me. Uh, it's one that I hadn't seen before very often. So their quantitative strand was uh, the collecting descriptive data as well as sending out a survey uh, to uh, 400 and some uh, faculty trainers, um, training directors. Then they also interviewed a number of folks, but the interview, the qualitative section, they said, Forrest et al. said, was really based on this grounded theory perspective. And their questions were about the, the nature of, of training um, and their perceptions of, of the faculty behaviors and the problematic behaviors and what helped and what did not help, and what facilitated and what hindered. Um, so this study was a sequential explanatory model with a strong theoretical overlay, a grounded theory and constructivism. If you go and, and read this article, it's laid out really well for a mixed method article. And if you're going to emulate something, you want to look at it because they're very clear about their theoretical orientation, how they're thinking about their data strands, how they're bringing them together, and um, how theory really plays into their data and their analysis. The thing that I thought was interesting was that they relegated the grounded theory only to the qualitative interview piece, whereas for me, because of the conclusions they were making and the generation of theory that they were trying to do, I felt like the article was actually, the whole thing was um, embedded in grounded theory, even the quantitative piece. So I almost would have put the grounded theory as a, as a top layer theory under which they were asking these uh, basic research questions. Uh, but they didn't write it up that way. And I would love to talk to the authors at some point and see why that is. But the mixing for the study occurred between the strands, uh, quant into qual, and during the final discussion on the effective and ineffective strategies for addressing problematic behavior, um, problematic faculty behaviors. Additional issues that are coming up within mixed methods um, designs, things that are being discussed right now. Um, Hess and Bieber wrote an article on the problems and prospects of teaching mixed methods designs. And this is in that second journal I was mentioning, the International Journal of Social Research Methodology. And this author proposes that um, many mixed methods teachers actually are really well versed in quantitative or qualitative, and he uh, has Bieber proposes that when teaching mixed methods, you do it as a team. You have a team method, somebody who's really well versed in quant and somebody who's really well versed in qualitative, and they come in and they co-teach it. Now, uh, that's uh, this discussion that uh, Hess and Bieber are having, a very interesting article. Another um, article right now just published in 2018 by Fox and Aldred is a challenge to the Crestwell and Plano-Clark's um, 
discussion of pragmatism. And they are coming from a new materialism perspective, uh, which is a relational materialism, that's how they describe it. And saying that um, it's, it might be more appropriate in some cases to have, to move away from a pragmatic standpoint or view and into more of a, a um, sequential new materialist view. So for those of you interested in kind of uh, philosophy of research, I'd direct you to that discussion. Now there's a lot of different discussions that are happening within mixed methods research. Another one that I didn't include here was on triangulation and uh, different um, perspectives on how to triangulate and problems that come up during triangulation. This goes back to an, the earlier discussion I had about um, two people feeling the same elephant or one person feeling an elephant and one person feeling a lion. If you're not really clear about how you've structured your research, uh, then, you, then how do you know that you're actually looking at or triangulating the same phenomena? You might actually be looking at two separate phenomena if you, if you weren't really clear and conscious about how you were doing it. Uh, I would direct all of you to uh, Mixed Methods on the Hub, the Research Hub, and our research community. Uh, we have, so if you go to the hub and click on research community, then go to the special interest group. Our SIG is the research method SIG, and you can go to the mixed methods page uh, or click on that link, which will take you right to the methodology group. There's lots of other great pages there on all the different types of research methods. Uh, we also have a blog. Um, there's been a few blog posts in there, and hopefully we'll get some more and discuss different aspects of methodology. If you do have questions, feel free to go there and you know, start a blog or ask questions there on a, on a blog. One of the blogs that I posted was on the use of focus groups within mixed methods designs. So for those of you interested in combining focus groups in mixed methods, you can go read that blog post. And our next webinar, uh, now that I'm coming to the conclusion of this one, uh, just to give a shout out to Brian Sloboda. Dr. Sloboda is the University Research Chair for the Center for Management and Entrepreneurship. He is going to pre be presenting on May 10th, uh, Quantitative Experimental Designs. So I know that I'm gonna be there. I, uh, well, I'm interested and in, looking forward to hearing Dr. Sloboda talk on quantitative experimental designs. With that, what questions do we have today? Remember to unmute the phone. I mean the the phones, please. The the microphone. Hi, this is Karen Johnson. Hi, Karen. Um, when when students are attempting to do a mixed methods dissertation at U of P, how important is it, in your opinion, for them to identify specific qualitative design and a specific quantitative design. I see lots what? of proposals coming to like my URM classes where they're, they're just talking about a quantitative strand and a qualitative strand and not really defining the design within those two approaches. I would think it's important in order to make sure that they know again where they're targeted. Um, the, to make sure they're looking at the same phenomenon and really triangulating the same phenomenon or um, if you're doing a mix, I mean case study is an almost inherently mixed methods, but um, I guess it depends on, on what they're doing, but I would always, for me, I always ask my students, what do you mean quantitative? What is it that you are trying to get at? Are you doing a correlational? Are you trying to do a randomized, you know, controlled study? Are you doing a single group design, a comparison design? Um, I mean, there's so many different aspects to that. Sometimes students uh, misidentify simple collection of descriptive data, like demographic data, as quantitative research. Right. And, and it really isn't. Uh, to be doing, uh, in my opinion, a real mixed method design, you have to be doing collect, collecting something more than just your demographic data. Right. Yeah. 
Um, the other piece for qualitative, uh, even if they're using a general qualitative design like thematic content analysis, I would still want them to state that very specifically. Uh, most likely they don't understand and I say this with a lot of students, a lot of even my own students at other universities, um, I have to remind them that every qualitative design is embedded in a worldview with a specific um, ontology, epistemology, axiology, teleology. Uh, they, um, you know, using narrative, for example, if, they, if they're using narrative research as their qualitative strand, that's a constructivist approach and they have to understand what it means to be uh, to say that your information is constructed your your um, your phenomena that you're looking at is constructed phenomena as, as opposed to uh, well uh, yeah anyway I could right. go off on a tangent <laughs> great question though gets me excited thank you yep Other questions? Comments? Sharing your own experiences? Just wanted to quickly thank you for the presentation, Ryan. <clears throat> Excuse me. Just wanted to thank you for the presentation. You did a great job. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. Yep. Appreciate it. And just a comment on the slide. The presentation is being recorded. And I'm going to be posting the recordings into the research group. And you will get a notification on how to download and pull the link. Now, Armando, I just saw somebody post. Um, we're getting some comments here. So I'm going to open up our chat box. Um, this is Mansur uh, Ryan. Uh, thank you for the great presentation. Um, uh, I, uh, first of all, I guess Mark tried to ask a question, but somehow we cannot hear him. Uh, so, Armando, you may want to try to see what is the issue. Uh, also, I just wanted to um, ask you if you can recommend particular topics or questions that are really perfect and appropriate for are you uh, are you suggesting that there are particular uh, questions that are really perfect for this mix method or not? That's my question. There are, and that's a great question, Mansura. Um, that actually has a it's a longer discussion, which I would point you back toward the designing and conducting mixed methods research by Park. Um, they have. Uh, uh, one or two chapters specifically on that, uh, selecting a topic. Uh, I think that if you are looking at something like, what's the lived experience of watching a sunset? That's not a mixed methods question. So that you're looking at something like phenomenology. Um, when you are when you have a broader question, it's easier to think about integrating qualitative and quantitative strands. You know, a larger, a, a larger type of, uh, if that if that makes sense. I mean, without really getting into the the lengthy discussion that, that Cresswell goes into. Yes, yes. I just wanted, I, I mean, that's a general recommendation, which is good, particularly for, I guess, students or novice researcher, if they want to consider using mixed method, they, you're saying that they make, they need to make sure that it's uh, broad enough. Yes, yes, exactly. And, and that their quantitative strand isn't just collecting the demographic data. Right. right. That, that doesn't really count. Yeah, Can you see the chat, Ryan? Can you see the chat? There is a question on data using database. Can you see that? Yes. yes. Yeah, I was going to do that next. Thanks. Thanks. So, uh, does that answer your question, Mansura? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 
Yep, you're welcome. So Paula Miller posted, uh, can you use a database from previous for the quantitative part? Yes. So you can use archival data as um, your quantitative strand, um, which, you know, maybe you know, big data analysis. You could incorporate big data analysis as one piece of your quantitative strand and then have a, a focus group or a Delphi group and then you might interview four or five or 10 or 15 people about a particular topic related to whatever your question is. Does that answer your question, Paula? Great, she texted yes. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? I have a question. This is Mary Lynn. Hi, Mary. You know, I just learned, I'm a quantitative person, but I was just um, using over the weekend to do and I was watching some videos on how to take open-ended material, you know, responses to questions verbally, um, and then to use demographics about each respondent, and then to use, you know, the classified key themes in the the text in the in the verbal material. And then to produce uh, sort of graphs and charts off of that. Um, well, that's somewhere between quantitative and qualitative, right? Or is it more qualitative descriptive? Yeah. And we're getting a lot of echo. If we could have, um, I don't know, Armando, if your line is on, if we could shut that off. But um, yes, uh, Mary, the deduce is great for. You, making those graphs um, the, that use the descriptive piece um, and you can separate out, for example, what are all the themes that males versus females or that this group versus that group had and what's the kind of relationship. And they, but uh, deduce also uses things like cross tabs and, and different things. Um, deduce, we actually have a presentation coming up on May 17th that the research methods SIG is hosting. Uh, Eli Lieber, one of the creators of Deduce, is going to come in and talk to the faculty. So uh, it'll be this same type of webinar format, but Eli will be the one talking and presenting Deduce and everything you can do with Deduce. Um, but yeah, yeah he's got some great videos online. Yes, he Levi does. At UCLA. Yep. yep. And uh, yeah, I would say that's more of a qualitative study, but using the descriptive uh, the demographics to look at the relationship between the different groups. Uh, I don't know if I would call it a true mixed method design, and here's why. Um, in Chapter 9 of the Designing and Conducting Mixed Methods Research, uh, Cresswell and Pono Clark talk about um, misnomers and different um, definitions of mixed methods research. It really does come down to how you're uh, defining your uh, defining mixed methods research because do people do define it slightly differently. He, uh, there, those two define mixed methods research as collecting both quantitative and qualitative data, and um, analyzing qualitative and quantitative data. Now he does say in that chapter that the, there is a position that says you can have your qualitative um, data set that you then analyze in both a quantitative and qualitative way, like content analysis, for example, often will quantify um, certain aspects of the qualitative data. So uh, if you're doing a content analysis and then you're maybe doing a hermeneutical analysis, those would be do two different types of a, a quantitative and a qualitative analysis of the same qualitative data set strand. That makes sense. So again, it comes down to how you're defining mixed methods. Interesting. You know, content analysis, I guess I don't know enough about it. I was sort of thinking it was it was like to do so it's like using big data to go through streams of text to come up with 
clustering of themes. Well, yeah, yeah. Am I wrong on that? The, there's different types of content analysis. There was actually a presentation um, a couple of weeks ago on content analysis, which was a great presentation. Um, I would recommend that you go back and, and look at that. Um, there's qualitative and quantitative aspects of content analysis. And uh, Eric Bean and Karen, I believe, were the two that were presenting on that. Or, no, Karen? No, who was the other? Liz? Eric yeah, Bean I'm, I'm well. sorry I missed that. I'll look for the recording, yeah. Yeah, so that's, that is saved on the um, research methodology site. So. But you are right that th those are aspects of content analysis along with other types of analysis. All right, well, we're at 6 o'clock. Uh, any final questions? Well, 6 o'clock my time, 5 o'clock Pacific. Well, thank you, everybody, for uh, joining me this evening and uh, listening, and we really appreciate you uh, taking your time. This will be up online if you want to go back or send students to it, uh, just so they have an orientation. Uh, uh, resources are also listed on the pages, um, whether it's the mixed methods page within the research methodology SIG or one of the other methods. There's lots of resources there. So um, look forward to seeing you all at the next webinar. All right. Thank you, everybody.